Well, hello. Welcome. Welcome to Brain Club. Um, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm the executive director here at All Brains Belong, and we're really glad that you're joined us today. Let me share screen and get us oriented. So today we'll be talking about authentic systems change and um, some ways of thinking about that. Brain Club, of course, is our educational space, providing education to the broader um, ABB community about neurodiversity and related topics of inclusion for purposes of contributing to systems change by shifting social norms, developing shared language um, with the idea that you come here um, and take what you learn and experience into the rest of your lives. This is a place where we're hoping that you come to feel safe, um, collectively learn, unlearn, promote new ways of thinking and being in the world. And as I said, go out into the world and, and spread it. This is not for medical or mental health advice. It's not a support group. ABB has programs that do those things, but this one is not one of them. This is an education program. So it's not, um, it's, it's, it's uh, not, a, not a place to discuss or solve individual situations. All forms of participation are okay here. Um, you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly do not need you to sit still or look at the camera or any other neuronormative construct. Feel free to walk or move or fidget or stim or eat or whatever else needs doing. And in addition to um, communicating in whatever way is most uh, comfortable for you, you can, um, we'll have plenty of time for conversation at today's Brain Club after um, our pre-recorded video with our guest presenter. Um, but after that, you'll be welcome to uh, unmute and use mouth words, type in the chat. Um, also, observation is a completely valid form of participation. There will never be demand or pressure to interact in, 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 in any direct way. We also have private messaging uh, set up if you want to ask a question that way or make a comment that way. And in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, uh, we just ask that, um, you know, sometimes when topics come up that maybe, you know, have, especially things that have been distressing to you, we just ask that you discuss the impact of your experiences, not specific events. And uh, we work together to balance individual versus collective group needs. Um, and uh, I, I, speaking of, of, of needs, um, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. But depending on your version of Zoom, you might find you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. But if not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. You can also uh, do the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. And that's my visual support to actually open up the chat. Here we go. So now I'll see if anybody's using it. Why I like almost started chuckling to myself is because I realized that uh, I skipped a slide. We worked very hard to make this particular slide and I only used it once and then subsequently lost it for like three brain clubs after that. And that relates to the chat, which is um, the chat is such an example of navigating conflicting access needs. For some brains, the chat is a really important accommodation. It's a way of getting your thoughts out in real time, not having to wait to insert yourself in the conversation. It's a way of not having to use working memory to like rehearse your idea and hold on to it for five minutes and it's gone and you can't process and pay attention. It's a way of communicating without mouth words, which is um, uh, something that many brains really struggle struggle to do. Um, and so at the same exact time, there are many brains that the chat is really overstimulating and exhausting and distracting and all of it. And so both of those things are true. And um, we try to have the main idea be on the screen. The chat tends to run in parallel. So if you want to just ignore it, go for it. Um, if you want to engage with it, go for that. That's how we how we balance. Um, Conflicted access needs of the chat. Okay, here we go. Um, so we are continuing our March theme systems change from the ground up. The idea of um, you know uh, coming together, envisioning the world we wish to see, and 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 just 
doing it and not really needing to have a whole lot of um, drama or overcomplication about it. And so um, uh, what, and, and, and I shared these slides with you last week too, but just the idea that we know that the status quo doesn't work. The status quo is failing neurodivergent people. Neurodivergent people are far more likely to struggle to access all kinds of broken systems. And those broken systems, they not, they're not only broken and they don't work, they, they also don't talk to each other, um, which is um, one of the major um, contributions to um, poor health. Um, poor health, because all of these other things are part of health. Um, I wanted to wanted to share again. Um, we're we're very proud to release our first ever impact report um, on, of this this grand experiment the last two years of uh, what 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 would it look like to create a different kind of healthcare that integrates medical care into social connection, bringing people together, connecting with the community. Um, supporting employment, helping people develop a deep understanding of their access needs. Did you know this could be healthcare? Uh, so we're uh, very, very, very pleased um, uh, to share this with you. And um, what uh, what what happens here often? I know some of you have been have been here for two years. Some folks are new; it's your first time ever. Uh, so welcome. Anyway, um, what 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 we have here is a village, um, a village of learning and healing together. And um, I'm uh, very pleased to share uh, an, an interview um, that I did with Dr. Winnie Luby who is the academic core coordinator for function coordinator for UVM Center on Disability and Community Inclusion and a member of our board of directors um, who's been with us almost from the very beginning. Um, and what you'll, what you'll hear Dr. Luby talking about is what um, systems change means to her and um, how um, some of the nuances sometimes that 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 happen when you try to co-create an experience um, with community members. So David, take it away. And I think this I think this video will run about maybe I think it's about 15 minutes um, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion. So so the, the idea of you know, systems change. And we've like talked, you know, you know, I've talked about system change before and like how that's like an important part of what we want all brain belong to be doing. Like, can you, can you say like what, what that, what system change like that, you know, mean means to you or could, could mean to you? Yeah. Well, I think as we were talking about um, ideas and energy and drive comes from the people up rather than um, you know, this top down where it's being dictated to you what you should be doing or not doing or how you should be doing it. Um, and the co-creation piece, I think, is, is part of that. Um, you know, like, <laughs> uh, if I think about, uh, I always think about, like, say, public services, like, um, like uh, food stamps or uh, Section 8 or Social Security or those kind of things. Like, those systems would work so much better if they actually paid attention to how people are using it and the barriers that they're facing with it, right? If they were actually acting on the things that aren't working, it would be so much easier. I could not agree more. And like, it's actually not that hard to ask people, you know, even like, and we, and, and, but I think it's a lens, it's a lens of, you know, I really, I want to know, I want real time feedback on what I'm doing so that I can make little tinkers and adjustments. Um, I wonder if in like a big system, you just realize that you couldn't even make changes. So why bother asking feedback? I don't know. I don't know. What do you, just, what do you think about that? Well, I think about um, the importance of having folks with lived experience in those positions that can make change at that level. Because of, you know, otherwise you're kind of talking to the wall, like you have a few people who kind of get it and they're sympathetic, but um, if you have people in positions of power who can actually lead the way and model, like this is a different way to do it, I think that's the way to have the change really. So like having um, 
you're working with people about employment, I think that's a really powerful model for sure, because then those people can model for other people, right? That they can see that it can be done. Um, like I had a, I, I got asked to speak at a class a few months ago, and I was very open about my own like neurological challenges and my family and da 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 da. But I also talked about how um, I felt like I was in a very privileged place to be able to have a job that really valued all of those parts of me, right? And I had feedback from the students that go, wow, it is possible to like actually be myself someplace and be <laughs> and be valued and have work and take care of myself. Like I don't have to bend myself into these knots that aren't realistic or I don't have to feel bad that I can't make my brain do something different than what I can do. Um, and so I think that's where those, those changes happen, right? Like those, those small moments where you can actually, you know, you never know how you're changing somebody's life just by talking about something, you know? Right, um, because I think that it's some, at least for me, sometimes I don't even really, I don't have language to understand my experience until I've heard someone else name it. And I'm like, oh, I would never have come up with those words, but that is the exact thing that goes on in my head, wow. Whether I, whether I hear it or I read it or, or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's why it's just so, I think it's important that even though everybody can't be happy with everything, I think it's still important to have the platform and, and opening there. Yeah, yeah, I'm not gonna be able to, to, to please everybody. Right, mm -hmm. right, because if you're pleasing everyone, the only way to really do that is if you are, if you're serving a group of people who has homogenous goals, and mm -hmm. you know there might be some some reason for that if that's true and it's okay mm -hmm. to have a homogenous goal like you know a shared goal like a shared vision like you know um i believe that i want to come to a you know a space where i can be my true self like we can agree on that goal um but but you know it's more big picture as opposed to i want this program to look like this mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think it's great that you're still open to hearing all of that, even if some of those things people want aren't practical or they're hard to deal with or whatever. I think that you're providing the platform is the important part, right? <laughs> we are so proud of the model of co-creating programs with the people we're serving, and we're so, like, we're just so into that, you know, and it's like really important to us, right? And then there's this line, there's this balance between like, you know, some centralization and some structure um, and some, you know, balancing the organization's needs with the needs of the people in it. It's the conflicting access needs. I'm remembering when um, my younger daughter started preschool um, and she'd just been diagnosed with autism. She's only four, her language is coming have lots of angry outbursts, right? And so on the one hand, we want her to be able to express herself and tell us what's going on. On the other, she had to learn how to operate in this system where it wasn't okay to do that. <laughs> and it's still tricky, right? She's 18 now and it's still tricky. It's like, it's okay to be yourself. And in this situation, you have to <laughs> put a lid on it. You know, um, yeah, that's hard with people you don't know, I mean, I have always like, and maybe this is just my PDA, but um, like I've always just found most systems unsafe. Like they just, like you can just like, just even as a little kid being like, this makes no sense. This is arbitrary. This is not, you know, oh, this is not open to feedback. You know, I remember even being like a middle schooler being like, you know, why, why don't you ask the students? Why, you know, you know. anyway, um, it, 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 it just always felt like not that systems are like really, maybe I could say this. Most systems are really designed to, to perpetuate systems. They're not really like, you know, so it just, it, it has always felt intuitive to me that starting over and starting something new um, that wasn't part of a system um, would be more effective, at least faster, a lot, a lot, at least faster to get some sort of 
impact to happen. Um, and maybe it's maybe it's just my brain that I uh, delayed gratification is really hard for me. I want that thing now. I want it right now, not because I'm going to get distracted, um, but because like I just it's just it's otherwise just too hard. Um, anyway, um, but but I and 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 I think at all brains belong. It's it's all these all these little all these little things that. It would be really difficult to do in, let's say, a traditional medical system. Um, but I think that having the opportunity to share what we're doing um, has been really cool because some of it actually is reproducible mm -hmm. in traditional systems. So, but at least to get into the weeds of like, well, this is what our menu looks like. Like, this is what universal design for medical care looks like. and. And you know this is this is this is actually doable. You can just really, anyway, um, but because I, I I think like you're saying the student who for the first time hears that like it's a thing that you can be a professional with a job and like not be contorting yourself in fifty thousand ways. Like I think professionals also need to hear that you don't have to be tortured by the system you work in. Yeah, I think so. I think it's a very um, powerful kind of, I don't know if social justice is the right word, but I think the more people can be themselves in those situations, the more effective they're going to be, um, the more authentic it feels to interact with them when they're being their whole selves and they're not holding back something because they don't think, you know, these other folks will want to hear it, but they can actually speak their minds a little. like. Um, yeah, like I, I, I really, I really think, <laughs> I think the more, this is kind of like easy and hippy dippy, but I feel like if everybody felt empowered to be their true self and you're not hurting anybody, you're just being yourself, right? And you pick the kind of job you want, you have the kind of family that you want, um, the friendships that you want, everybody be happy, right? <laughs> They weren't like kind of feeling pressure to clamp down some pieces of ourselves, right? Um, totally. And think about how much like cognitive effort is required to like clamp down, suppress, like all that. Well, it's you know it's funny you say that. I don't. Maybe you know the story. I don't know if you know the story. Um, the story of how Kid Connections got founded. Do you know that story? So. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, it's the best. Okay, so um, uh, uh, a, a then eight year old on the junior advisory board. Um, we were like in a backyard, um, and um, I, I said, you know, we're, we've been really thinking about how do we how do we help kids feel like they belong. Do you have any thoughts about that? And this this sweet little love, he says, you let us do what we love. Mm. What, do you, what do you what do you mean? Well, if I'm doing what I love and that kid's doing what they love, like we're gonna feel like we belong. Right. Nice. So right. that's that was kid connections like that. I mean, that is system change from the ground up. This is like a sweet little love with a sweet little idea that changes the world. You know, we've got 140 sweet little loves who now have friends like. Nice. Um, and, you know, did did school solve that problem? No. Um, right. So so it's uh, it, it sometimes just doesn't have to be so complicated. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Definitely. Yeah, that's that's a great story. I'm glad you told me that. That's awesome. awesome. Well, I, I I think in my head, um, part of why I'm really enjoying being a part of all this this journey is because the the kernel of what you're doing feels so common sense, right? It's just so easy, <laughs> and is if you're able to pass on the word as much as possible. You know, I can picture like, you know, 10 years from now, at least four or five other practices like yours would be amazing, right? Um, all over the, you know, all over the country or wherever. Like, I think that would be really, really great. Really great. Yeah. And then for people to even know that it exists, they're like, oh, I can, I can actually seek out practices like that. I don't have to stay with this thing that I don't feel good about. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for saying that, right? Because I think like so many people, they have, they've never, like even in the healthcare space, they've never had a healthcare experience that feels safe and comfortable. They've never had a job where they could show up as their true self. They never had that. So they don't know that that's possible. So you see it 
hopefully you you see it because you're experiencing it. But even if you don't, you know, yeah, I hope I hope that that does you know does help adapt people's expectations of what they should be expecting and demanding um, yeah. from the their environment. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, what they should demand and expect, right? Like it's reasonable to expect that you're going to feel safe when you go to the doctor or any of those things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would say like as a patient, um, like I maybe about a year ago, I went in, I went in to get dental care and um, it, there was like so much COVID going on, like like so many people had COVID in our practice. And I went in and like nobody was wearing masks. Um, and it felt really unsafe. And then it's an open air thing. Um, I'm going to, I'll edit all this out, but, but I'm, you know, this open air thing and the person in the stall next to me coughed and I flipped out and I walked out and I, I, it was very difficult for me to get mouth words out, but I was, I was, uh, all I was able to say is like, it's not safe here. And I walked out, you know, I would never have been able to do that without my experience of transformation through the ABB village, because I am surrounded by people who think about safety and think about like, ooh, I have an internal body signal that sends me a, like sends me a clue that like something in my environment is not a fit for my access needs. Like I didn't have that lens before this. Oh, wow, that's a really good. I, yeah, that's a really good example. That's good. Yeah, I, I didn't feel like I could talk about myself in any kind of deep way until I got involved with ABB, really. I mean, it just like, it spoke to me immediately as something that like, you know what, Winnie, you're going to be 50 something. <laughs> At some point, you're going to need to be authentic with people. Why not start right now? <laughs> that part of your journey, that is so amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> You know, it's so interesting because it's it it is like this grand social experiment of like, hey, I'm gonna show up and try to be authentic. Um, you wanna do it with me? I don't really know what that looks like. I've never really had it before, but you know, let's do it. And I I think there's so many people who are 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 hungry for such a thing. So too. I think so too. And when I'm with um, you know, in, in environments where I know people are, you know, they're plenty nice, but I know they're not giving us the whole story, right? They're just kind of giving a, a mask of who they are. And now I sit in those meetings and I'm like, ah, oh, that's too bad. Yeah, it's too bad. It's like, oh, mm, yeah, yeah. I, I before it you. used to be like, oh, I wish I could hold it in that good, you know? Yes. Like that's not even the goal because right. like now my expectation is authenticity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Oh, thank you so much. Is there anything else you want to say before I shut off the recording? Uh, no, just thank you for inviting me. And I really appreciate being a part of all this. I really, really do. Such a feel good interview to, to have. Yes. I love Winnie Ruby also reading Laura's comment in the chat. So, you know, I, I think for me, the part of that interview where we talked about hit connections, that was like, that was my favorite part of that interview because it was like, you ask the people who are directly closest to the problem. So if you're going to try to think about something for a kid, yeah, you ask a kid, right? So, so why doesn't that happen everywhere? Um, Yeah, like it's not hard and it's not expensive, you know, it's, it's like we talk about at All Brands Belong, like you ask what people like and you do it and you ask what stresses them out and you don't do it. And yet that, that is kind of wild, right? That that's like revolutionary, that that's like a, that's like a really big, unique thing. And yet it is. 
I wonder, and I wonder what others would say about this, but I think that when you grow up being told that there's one right way to do the thing and your, your experience is not centered even in your own life, like, doesn't that, doesn't that, you know, contribute to being in a world where, you don't we don't think to necessarily ask other people about the experiences that are closest to them. So yeah, it's radical. Michelle. I was starting to type, but I'm like, no, this is too long. I think there was an article in the Globe this week, or maybe it was Flipboard, but I really like this article. It was about a teacher who um, was doing a lesson, but she didn't really tell her kids it was a lesson. And this was, I think, like third graders or something. And um, they had a fish tank in the classroom, and she took a fish out. And she put it on the floor and it started to gasp for air, as you would imagine. And then she told everyone they were not allowed to move or else they would get detention or something. And then she left. And everybody was appalled because the fish was dying and they were going to get in trouble. Finally, one little girl couldn't stand it anymore. And she went and got the fish and dumped it back in the tank. And um, eventually the teacher came back in. The kid did not get in trouble. And the point to this was sometimes you have to violate the norms and do what's right. And that was the whole point of the story. And I think what I was thinking is when you were saying we're taught to do the thing, it's hard to violate the norm. It's hard to go against the teacher saying you're going to get in trouble if you save that fish and it's just so hard to overcome authority and norms that we sit there and we we do what we know is not necessarily right <laughs> anyway, it's like uh, story. It, it's, it's it's like the stanford prison experiment um you know there's all kinds of things that get right. normed right yeah. So I, I actually, so Liz's interpretation of that um, uh, from the chat, my safety is wrapped up in the teacher's approval, right? So my safety is wrapped up in, 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 in everyone's approval. My safety is wrapped up in my, you know, my caregiver's approval. My safety is wrapped up in my partner's approval of the bullies at school, of the self-selected cool kids, of like, there's so much of that. And I think earlier someone was, I don't know who it was, somebody in the chat was just talking about people pleasing. I mean, it's all of it. Right. And anyway, that story stayed with me. <laughs> yeah, it's really something. Did you turn your video on because you wanted to share? Oh, okay. Nice to see you. I just finally was in a spot where my family wasn't eating around me, so I turned on the video. Amazing. Lovely to see you. Um, so so I'm I'm curious, um, you know, whether you are new to our radical social experiment of showing up authentically or or have been been with been part of this for a while um does does having the experience of showing up authentically anywhere does that change what your experience is when you're somewhere else do you notice anything differently
And she says, authentic feels better. Paul says, when I think about giving my preferences for interaction in any situation, it's not a usual situation. Not sure if I know my preferences because I'm not used to being asked. Yes. Yes. Hello. Laura. Uh, hang on one second, Laura, <laughs> and then Summer. <laughs> it's feast or famine and participation. Mm. Go ahead, Laura. I was just going to say, I feel like things bother me more. Like, I feel like I'm more readily able to identify things that aren't right. Um, like Tracy put in the chat, how to be fish savers and still feel safe enough. I think I feel more safe in places that make me feel braver. And I think I'm more annoyed at injustices that I can more readily recognize um, than I could before being part of this village and practicing this authentic showing up thing. I think it's it's the whole business of you sh you you shift your norm for what you demand and expect. Summer. I mute myself. Um so I have to agree with what everybody has been talking about as far as, you know, just the the amazing feeling of being authentic, but then you have to kind of be a little, I don't know about being careful. I mean, I try to kind of look at all of my situations and then I sort of choose what I'm going to share. If I'm going to be myself or maybe I'm going to hold back a little bit. Um, but the way that I grew up, you know, I was told that, you know, I was a child, I was, I was supposed to be present, but, but be quiet. You know, my input didn't matter. And even when I got into school and teachers, I would find people not listening to me, you know, maybe they're laughing at me or they were bullying me because they didn't like what I was saying because it was different. So then I had taught myself to, you know, just keep everything inside. So with the whole people pleasing, you know, I really got sick of doing that because I think some situations are worse than others because you're not being authentic. Um, for instance, I own a business and so I tell people some really unhappy information sometimes about where they work or they live about their, their structures. And if I tried to sugarcoat that, it wouldn't help anybody. And I'm in an industry where I've seen that happen a lot. And in the last three months, you know, I've really done my best to be authentic, even just being personal with my clients and telling them things. And it's really made it so that, um, they connect to me, they trust me, and they appreciate me being authentic. And nobody's bullied me or laughed at me. And it's a really different type of atmosphere than when I was a child. And Mel, I think a lot of it has to do with the terminology. You know, you have been able to teach me terms that for whatever reason, the outside world understands better than me trying to express or explain my feelings, which leads people down a different trail. Um, so I think that has a lot to do with it. Just the way that you have taught everything in Brain Club in your group sessions, it's really helped to um, make it so that I can explain it to others and then they're spreading the word as well. So I think authenticity, it's really important, but there are times that you might wanna just hold it back for yourself, maybe not for other people, um, just to save yourself any kind of burnout or something but it's very liberating and I thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing all that. And you're absolutely right. And, you know, it, it's, uh, um, Sarah, what did we, what did we talk about the other day? What, what, what did we say about the, um, map, uh, the, the difference between masking and like strategic, like, like, like being strategic. Right. It was, to... it was like, yeah. Some, what's the difference between, um, uh, unmasking and, uh, being strategic, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think cause we were, it actually came out of last week's brain club. Cause I was, I was, I was observing that I didn't like watching myself in the video because right. I was not, I, I did not feel authentic. Um, right. I did not feel, um, I, and I could see, I could see the, like, the strategy of it all. Um, and it was, it was exhausting to do and it was existing to watch. 
Um, so that, I'm read Sarah's comment from the chat. Um, uh, so, so in talking about um, uh, showing up and being authentic, um, Sarah says, I so long for this world. At the same time, I suspect that evolutionary biology gives us a realistic appraisal of how revolutionary that actually is. When I think of how bodies are designed, how the most vulnerable and arguably the most essential parts of us are hidden most deeply within and protected by masks and armor, then you get an idea of how dangerous nature thinks it is to be open and authentic. Now, absolutely, that's why it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen, it's, it's not safe out there. Um, and depending depending on all kinds of aspects of of, 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 of of identity, all the characteristics that 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 you know all the different ways that humans are othered, right? So so there there are many people who it, it is it is it is not safe to show up authentically. Mel, I think that points to like what what well, like what ABB does and what you've what you've done with ABB and and I what I hear ABB saying all the time about the importance of queuing safety like if I have any power in the world or if I have any power and privilege relative to other people in my world I'm going to be viewed as a threat or a potential threat unless I like bend over backwards to actually queue safety and actually like let other people know that like vulnerability is wanted and welcome here and if i and 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 and, and um and even then people are going to like have to have go through their process to learn whether or not that's trustworthy and whether or not that's just a, a line i'm feeding them or or whether or whether that's um or whether it's or whether it's real um, but it but but it it but at a bare minimum Like it's like the, the transformation I think is going to come from when I use that power and privilege to start queuing safety and to start and, and actively to, to, to trying to make it safe for everybody to be, um, to, for, for, other, for others with less power to be who they are. Absolutely, and like power, power is so tricky, right? Because there's going to be environments where in order to access, like, so that the aspects of a person um, that, that may be associated with more privilege in order to access power associated with that privilege, sometimes you, you have to be less authentic in order to access that power. And even if the goal is to have power on behalf of others, it gets it gets circular because a world where not everyone can show up as their true selves and not everyone can access the resources that they need and not like all of it, it's it's we we all suffer. Shell sharing. Um, in the short time I've come into Brain Club, I've changed my view of how participants in Zoom meetings should behave. I used to think that if participants in any Zoom meeting didn't have their video on, then they weren't really engaged or, or were uncollaborative. I now realized how wrong that view is. Yeah, you know, isn't that, but, but isn't that what we were taught? Like, I mean, I remember in elementary school being taught, like, you, you know, you, you must if you're not looking at me, you're not paying attention. If you're not making eye contact, you're not being, it's like, I mean, that's, that's just ableism. And it's, it's, it's just embedded everywhere. Sarah says in the chat, there's not one right way to be a person. Yeah. I love when you quote my former five-year-old at Brain Club. I didn't even know that, that was oh, that's where that quote. That's where that quote came from. So for those who don't know, 
Um, oh yeah, child, that's right. When, yeah. When my child was five, um, I was uh, I I I told them I was going to go do a training of a bunch of professionals um, who work with children, um, and uh, I asked them, I asked them what I should tell the people, and they thought about it. Tell them there's no right way to be a person. It's my sweet little love. I love that. Oh, we should definitely make some merch. This is incredible. Courtesy of your child. But I think that's the whole point, right? That like we hear things at Brain Club every week and then they become part of our inner monologue, you know, and then we take that with us when we're doing other, that's the goal is to sort of take that inner monologue with us when we're doing other things that are more neuronormative to have that in the back of our head. Absolutely. And particularly, you know, how like, you know, the medical model would be like, well, you know, the, uh, those of us who tend toward delayed echolalia, like that's what our brains do. We take the thing and, and we play it again and it, it derives more meaning each time. Um, But I, and I, I do think that, you know, whether it is that you acquire a different, like, just like a summer was saying, just different words to name what you've always known, but now you either can, you say it in a way that clicks for someone else, or just maybe even you have a different way of understanding it. Like, um, um, uh, one, one of, one of our staff, um, one, one of the phrases that echo in my head, um, they said, um, you acquire language to wrap your brain around your experience. Whoa, yeah, that's what happens at Brain Club. Yes. Um, so the idea being that, you know, when you're around people navigating similar stuff and, and, and one, maybe we thought we were the only people who experienced that stuff. And so we're not alone. We're not broken. Um, and and maybe, maybe sometimes when something happens, um, like even um like like God at the beginning of Brain Club, where I was like, I can't even find the record button. My brain is just not connecting the things. I am actually aware that how I spent my day today was connected to how my brain is feeling right now. That is new information. Um, in the last you know, year or so. Um, the idea that, yeah, when, 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 when you spend your day in an environment that doesn't work for you, it's going to take a toll on you. And so depending on how much privilege, how much autonomy you have over how you spend your day or how much awareness you have about your access needs and, 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 you know, how much support you have in adapting your environments and routines, like that's going to impact how you feel. But I think if people don't talk about that, how would you know? We didn't grow up talking about this. We didn't know about this. Laura. Um, can I ask, Michelle had put a question in the chat earlier. Can I read it and ask you to respond to it? Because I- Yes, please. I'm so sorry for missing it. No, it was way earlier. Um, Michelle said, a question for later. How do you deal with organizations who think they're doing the right thing, but they are constantly being unconsciously ableist? Yep. So, and this is just me. I can only speak for myself. Like, I don't have, maybe it's not just don't have spoons for it, but like, you can't tell people they're doing it wrong. They flip their lids. It's not effective. So it's the oblique angle. It's the oblique angle of like, what can I say? What can I share that's connected with this person or this 
organization's values. And, you know, I, I think sometimes the great irony of this is that people, like, people, re a lot of people, not all people, but a lot of people really do want all people to feel like they belong and to be able to get their needs met. Like, a lot of people want that. They just don't realize that the thing that they are perpetuating is preventing that. So, again, I mean, that's true. That, I, I believe what I just said. The other thing I might say is that, right, Sarah, what Sarah said, I didn't even look at the chat. And then <laughs> I was trying to find words and I look at the chat and what you said is what I wanted to say. Right, it's, I opt out of this. This is not safe. It's like, I'm leaving the dentist. But again, depending on how much privilege and autonomy like what can you opt out of and what can't you opt out of and you know if you need a job you gotta like you know pay your rent and feed your family and you're in this place and you don't have bandwidth to like make an exit plan and you don't get to opt out at least not now well what if you come up with a plan <laughs> well I mean, the issue to make a plan, yeah. though, you need a little bit of access to your cortex or at least right. some support, support in helping you think through your exit strategy. And I think probably like through Brain Club and, and doing this, there might be a way to start that to help people figure some of that out. Because the only thing that I'm thinking is, of is if you don't tell them they're not going to do anything and then it almost enables them to continue you know these employers or whomever to do this to other people and for me like i'm just a different person but i prefer to tell people because even if i have to leave a job or i end a friendship or some kind of relationship if i planted a seed where they could go back even if it's years in the future and my voice echoes in their head and they're like, oh, that's what they meant. I just feel like people need to be told, even though it's scary, but a change won't happen if we don't tell them we sugarcoat it. Even if they're gonna get mad and we can't deal with it, maybe we can figure out a plan to collaborate with others, you know, and I don't know what that means, but I think everyone should be told, <laughs> doesn't matter what position of power you're in, that it's not okay to do certain things. And then if you have a group of people to rally and, and do whatever, you never know what could happen. But again, I don't know where that starts. But for me, my moral thing is I like to tell people, I don't, I guess I shouldn't say I like, I want people to know that there's another way to do things. And I don't want to enable them to continue doing it a way that I don't like, or that's not helpful universally. Right, and in, and in connecting this with Michelle's comment in the chat, like planting a seed, because again, um, it, it may not be safe to give direct feedback depending on the power imbalance. Laura. I feel like Mel, I've watched you in organizations where this is happening. And I think you have this really excellent way of recognizing the strategy of the organization and trying to almost tie to their mission a way that they might more effectively carry out their strategy. So saying like, it seems like what you really want people to know is this and a way that your message might be better heard is if you go at it from this angle. And it almost doesn't like, it's it almost seems like it avoids the call out and it gives them a new direction and helps them in a way that feels strategic towards their aims that you've helped them identify the oblique angle thank you for naming that but it requires so much access to my cortex to do that and I don't do it well all the time and when I do it it takes everything out of me and I can't do anything else that day um yeah. and sometimes it's worth it and most of the time it's not um and so it's and 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 that is also a matter of like triaging where you spend your your 
emotional and cognitive resources is this an area that's like is this is this situation even within my scope of influence and if it's not yeah I could plant a seed but like I also can just shut my video off and just like sit here because this is a waste of time because you don't get it Sarah did other people have their hands up I just Um, I didn't notice any because I okay. was probably not okay. paying attention. No, okay. Um, I, I, I mean, just I, I think that what what Laura said about what you do, uh, I mean, it, it's actually really extraordinary and really, really, really important. Um, one one of the things that that one of the ways that I at least make sense of like because I get into those situations that like like are that like are just described in the chat. And I get really confused. And, and I think how I'm starting to make sense of those situations, I think that there are values hierarchies. And so what I think a lot of organizations really want is to be thought of as good people. And so they're more than happy, they're they're more than happy to be jump on the the we're not ableist or you know, we're inclusive bandwagon. But, to, but they're using an inclusion, they're using the idea of being inclusive. The most important thing to them is not inclusion. The most important thing in their values hierarchy is to be thought of as good people. And so it's and so it's not and so and, and which exactly points out why you can't do a direct attack. You have to do a bleak an oblique attack. Because if I if I do a direct attack, I'm saying you're to them, you're not a good person. You have to do the like, you have to you have to zero in on the thing that makes them a good person is they have this lovely, you know, they have this lovely mission statement that makes them a good person, and then show them how their mission statement can be even more effective so that more even more people will like them. And, and, and I mean, it's just, you know, it's just, so anyway, but, but for anyways, it, it, but it helps me to get through the long short of it is it helps me to sort of look at when I'm feeling confused, it's like, oh, there's probably this values hierarchy going on where the thing that people are saying is the big value, the, the, the thing they really value isn't really what they, they might value it, but it's probably 10 on the list, not and and they say they value me and they say I'm at the top of their list, but no, you know, I'm at least number four. That is so well said. Yes. Um, it, it actually makes me uh, think that um, I don't know if anybody has attended um, every every year in April. So in this year, it's April 16th, the third annual uh, presentation of the Shifting the Autism Narrative, the Impact of Stigma on Health presentation. Um, uh, but there's like a slide that I get, to, I, get to see, I get the same talk every year. Um, and and uh, there's a slide that talks about like the brain science of social justice um, in terms of like expecting discomfort because when, because I mean, this this talk is like the, the it's it's the only time that because uh, I think it, it, it often draws like a health it, it, it draws our people and it draws, uh, you know, a healthcare audience, I think. Um, and so it's the it's the least oblique I ever am all year about like the, the like how the healthcare system is ruining autistic people's lives. Um, and that's what the talk's about anyway. But there's a slide that's like you're going to feel uncomfortable. And uh, you are going to have involuntary limbic responses to what you're about to hear. And so let's plan some let's plan some regulation strategies ahead of time um, with the idea of, you know, uh, what Sarah, what you said, when you tell the people they're doing it wrong, um, it, it is often, you know, involuntarily experienced as an assault on identity. But I do think, you know, I think what we've seen here is that, um, sorry, somebody's like using the vacuum. It's nowhere near me, but it's like as though it's the loudest thing in the universe right now. Um, anyway, I know that there are probably people who get that deeply. Um, so, so anyway, um, but oh, thank you for registering for the talk, Laura. That's great. Um, someone said, somebody shared in the chat um, that, uh, um, I don't remember what I was going to say. Um, oh, oh, oh the, just, 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 just the idea that. Um, well, I don't remember. I lost it. That was so thirty seconds ago. I think uh, Sarah, what were you saying? Uh, 
when we can get it back. Me, yeah, I was just talking about the values hierarchies, and that and that people really want to be seen as good people. So if you, if and when you give them feedback that they're not being if their primary value is to be seen as good people and you 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 say well you're not doing it right then they, they take it as you're not a good person and anyway that's does that help yes it does because i think like i i i, I and and this is where i i think that there are a lot of people who it's not performative they actually really want people to have good lives i think they really genuinely do um, it's just that when you are enmeshed in a neuronormative culture, you take these things for granted without recognizing, like, you know, neuronormativity, white supremacy, capitalism, like all these systems, like, you know, you just, you, if you grew up drinking the Kool-Aid, you think, you think that's what it is. And you don't even realize that it actually is counter to your values, to your values. Because it's just, oh, that's what we do. Same way that we expect, you know, hey, put your shoes on, child, you know, put them on independently. Independently. Like, it's just... Take it for granted. And so that's where, you know, the the oblique angle, you know, I think, I, 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 I think at ABB, you'll often hear like a, that, that's where a, a, did you know, like a good... Did you know question, um, you know, because because it, it in the did you know is always like this thing that I know you didn't know. It's a thing you've never thought about. It's not the opposite of what you think, you know. That's what oblique angle is. It's just like this is a thing that literally you've never thought about before. That is not directly counter to the thing that's wrong. in the chat um steve says one can be blissfully unaware of the water we all swim in yep someone always pees in the pool and doesn't say anything great analogy <laughs> laura says i think all the time about how painful assumptions simply are because i have usually have no idea i've made them until i find out that they're wrong yeah me too i think we all we all do that anyway um Thank you. Thank you for being part of this conversation. Um, and uh, we're gonna apply this. We're gonna apply, like uh, this is this is kind of building. Next week, we're gonna apply system change from the ground up to work. So last month we talked about redefining our relationship to work. Um, uh, next week's community panel um, is about grassroots efforts to really shift shift economic systems for people to get needs met and i it's a it's it's um they were pre-recorded interviews so i've already uh, i i actually made the inter and usually i do things very last minute i actually did this like well in advance and it's it's so powerful and I, some some of the panelists are going to be there live to join conversation afterwards so i think it's going to be great so uh, i look forward to seeing you then have a good week everybody